types of transmission lines and effective permittivity. In the past videos we talked about the model of a transmission line, we looked into the equivalent circuit that we can use, resistive components, capacitive and inductive components, and we stopped at having the equations which can describe the signal propagating in space as well as time. The one thing we have not yet talked about is how the transmission lines are actually implemented physically. And for microelectronic packaging we have more or less three types. And we are going to have a look at those types and also at the field distributions ar around them. Okay, so the first type is called a strip line. That was the first micro transmission line that was invented. It was introduced in the 50s by Airborne Instrument Labs and they also coined this term of a strip line. The other option you could have is call it a triplane. It's by a different company but usually what's used is the word strip line. Now what you see is that we have a signal conductor that's sandwiched between two ground planes within a dielectric material. So the green part here is always a dielectric while the orange part is something that's a conductor. In the most common case it will just be copper with some surface finish. Okay, then the second one we can have is a microstrip line which is called microstrip line because it's a bit smaller. So what you see here is that the line is more or less cut in half. We lose half of the dielectric, we lose the ground plane on top and we only have a signal which is separated from the ground by a dielectric. The last step we can do to make that even a bit more thin is go coplanar. As the name coplanar says, uh, we have ground and signal now on the same plane. Here you see that we will guide our fields in between the signal and the ground layer. What you could also have is a ground on the bottom, which would then be called a grounded coplanar. Then we would have to connect these grounds with vias to the ground on the bottom. Now, the pros and cons of all these different types of lines are not just with the physical implementation itself. The, the main difference between the lines is seen when we look at the actual electromagnetic field distribution around the line and this is what we will do next. So first for the strip line. Again, it's just zoomed in, we have our signal line here and two ground lines. Let's start with the electric field. You know that on every conductor the electric field has to be perpendicular on the surface, that's basic law of physics. So what you'll find is that at the surface of the conductor line, all our electric field lines are perpendicular and the same applies to the ground layers. This is why we get a shape that looks somewhat like this. So this is just a sketch, it's not exact calculation, it's just to give you some impression. Of course, you can now think how the magnetic field would have to look like. What are the boundary conditions for magnetic field on a conducting surface? Maybe you can think about that too and we will find that they are in kind of a loop form here. So for for strip line. Now we can have equations that give us the impedance and resistance and other loads calculated based on the feed distribution, but we will not go into detail for this type. Then the coplanar. Here we move our ground to the side and with the moving of the conductors, we also have to readjust the electromagnetic field because remember electric field perpendicular on surface. So here everything stays the same, but now it's not perpendicular up here, but at the sides, which gives us an electric field that looks somewhat like this. Again, just a sketch. The magnetic field in turn would then change a bit because now we have the two gaps here and we'll see we have field here that goes in this direction. Of course here it has to change sign because the electric field is also of a different sign. Now the last option is microstrip and here we will go into detail a bit. Here you can see that you have more or less half of the strip line configuration but now on top we have no ground plane that is mirroring the bottom ground and that now means that our setup is going to be asymmetric. 
here in the center you will still have something that's very close to like a standard parallel plate capacitor but the more you move to the edges you will see that the field gets distorted by the edge effect and up here you will have to see how they actually go close so what is the closest ground they can find there again electric field perpendicular and then the magnetic field around now what we can do is we can calculate the permittivity and the impedance because the permittivity is not the actual permittivity of this dielectric here. It will have the permittivity epsilon r as we know but the thing is that here you see the electric field is not just in the dielectric but also in air to a significant portion so we have to account for that. Now when we do that we have to take the general geometry into account and do some approximations. So I move that over here. I will just show you the equations without giving the complete calculation because it's out of the scope here. If you want to have a closer read, um, here's the textbook by Chen, which is a good compilation of different equations. And there you can also find further references to the original publications. Okay, just to be complete here. Okay, what do we do? First, we have to put some labels on the general dimensions. We have, of course, the epsilon r of our dielectric and then the epsilon r of air, which is on top, which is 1. So on all those calculations, we assume that the microstrip line is on air. If you have a different material there, you would have to adjust the calculations. Okay, then we have a length of the microstrip line, which we assume to be long, comparable to the other dimensions. We have the height of the dielectric, the width of the line and the thickness of the line. And for the first part we will assume that the thickness is very small. This is the approximation that is valid in most cases. Okay, and here come the equations. If we look at that, first we introduce this parameter u, which gives the relative um, value of width over height. Now why do we have to do that? And before we go into the details for the equations, I would like you to con just think about what does that mean when u is smaller than 1 or bigger than 1. Okay, we can achieve u smaller than 1 by making this width small compared to the height. That means that if we take this example, this would be very small here. Alternatively, we could make h very high. Now if we go back to our field distribution, what you will see is when we make this one smaller and smaller, so it's very narrow, you will see that the stray fields here in the edges, the edge fields, will have a higher impact because the, if you would think of like volume content, the, the volume of the stray fields is increasingly large compared to the fields that are more or less parallel plates in the center here. That means if we decrease the width, this impact is increasing. Now what happens if we increase height? We move up here. So this one gets thicker and this one moves up. And what you will see is that also the effect of those edge or fringe fields is, is increasing because it has more space to, to spread out. Okay, so this is why we have one case where those edge fields are more dominant. And in the other case, we we'll use larger than one, that would mean either the width is very high, so you can increase that here and you see that the part that's becoming dom dominant is, this is what is more or less a parallel plate part. On the other hand, you could make H very small and then you would see if you move that closer here, also you would become more homogeneous you could say. The homogeneous part of the field distribution would become more dominant. So those are those two cases that we're actually talking about here. And what we want to do now is to calculate the effective permittivity as a function of relative permittivity of the material and the dimensions and I just put the equations here. And what you can see is that when we're more homogeneous we will have this equation and if we become more inhomogeneous, we have to add a term here. Of course, also this is an approximation for a specific geometry, so um, 
as you can see here in this number, there are some approximations going on. But we can work quite well with that. Now, why do we need effective permittivity? If you remember, we want to calculate impedance and also um, the speed of our signal and other properties of our signal. And for that, we need to understand the, the permittivity in one term. This is why we kind of mix together the permittivity of air and material by these parameters. Okay, so now we have our effective permittivity. We can go and calculate the impedance now based on this value plus some extra terms. And here again, we have different approximation if we're closer to a homogeneous, more parallel plate-like geometry versus a higher or more inhomogeneous distribution. Okay. Now the last part we're going to look at is the impact of height, because here you now we just looked at height of the dielectric compared to the width, but we always assume that the thickness here is very small. But the more we go for miniaturization, the smaller our lines become, these thicknesses actually can become the order in the order of the, the width, for example. So we have to include another approximation. And this is because if we make this here very big, you will change the way that these fringe fields, these edge fields look like. You will have a significant increase in this component, which then could be labeled as a effect of width. So electrically, the width will not be close to the actual physical width, but become bigger due to the height effect. And for that, we have to add a term to the effective permittivity, which is given here. As you can see here, it's linear with thickness for a given combination of the other parameters. And we can also define an effective U that's given here. So here in these equations, we include U. Now again, for a different geometry parameters. And with that, we can close the analytical calculation. You can use these equations, look up for the details, and always keep in mind that every time we do an analytical calculation, we use approximations. And you need to be sure which approximation is valid, not only to take the right equation, but also to understand what the underlying physics are in the calculation that we're doing. Okay. Bye.